beginning 2 Timothy today. The progression of the pastoral epistles seems to be 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. The reason this book is so significant, this is apparently the last book that Paul wrote before his death under Nero in Rome. And it has some tremendous encouragement for the young preacher Timothy. There's been much speculation that he was a timid, shy, retiring person. I don't think we can get that from the text. He was at a uh, a very fast-growing church. There was heretics there, and Timothy needed encouragement how to handle them. So I think we put a <laughs> an unfortunate description on him that's not for certain when we make him timid and shy and that kind of thing. Let's begin then with verse 1. Many have said it's too formal to be a personal letter to a such a close friend as Timothy, and boy, Paul loved Timothy. And I think that's true, but must remember these. I think by this time Paul realized that his letters and the Gospels and others were being recorded, uh, kept, made uh, special. And I think he recognized this was going to be read to the whole church and probably going to be a very important source of truth down through the generations until the Lord comes. Now, Paul, an apostle, just like 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, uh, of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, this is obviously because of the false teachers that were present. Uh, Paul needed to show the other people in the church that Timothy had his full authority and that he had the authority of God. It accords with the promise of life. Now, there have been much uh, speculation on what promise of life this refers to. Well, let me give you a series of quotes. You look them up and see if this may be in Paul's idea. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, 2 Timothy 1, 10, and Titus 1, 2, that God alone possesses immortality. And he alone is the giver and preserver of life. And I think that's so true. Uh, that comes through union with Christ Jesus. Now, remember Paul, as an apostle, was an official sent representative of God in Christ. And Timothy was the official sent representative of Paul. And that's the, the chain through here. Now, to my dearly loved child Timothy. You might want to see 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, My genuine child. Paul loved this man. Apparently, he was converted. We're going to learn from his grandmother and his mother's influence. Uh, he lived in Lystra. Uh, we don't, we're not, he is not, his conversion is not recorded in the first journey, but on the second journey, he's already a believer, and a, Paul recognizes that and takes him with him. Now when it says, uh, from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember, God as Father. This has nothing to do with sexual generation. It also has nothing to do with chronological sequence. It has to do with the interpersonal relationships in the Jewish home. All the titles for God are drawn from intimate interpersonal relationships. God is husband, uh, God is father, God is go well, and on and on. And that's an example here. Now, Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus means Yahweh saved and given by the angels in Matthew 1, 21. It's used in the New Testament authors in the sense of his humanity. And Lord is, of course, the... Uh, the Jews pronounced this name instead of the word Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, because they were afraid to pronounce the covenant name, which is the Hebrew verb to be from Exodus 3.14. And so it came to be used by the New Testament authors of Jesus' full deity. Okay, now, look at verse 3. I thank God whom I worship as my forefathers did. Now, recognize here that Paul was not conscious of Christianity being something new. He saw it as a fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. He saw it as a completion or a fruition of the Judaism that he had been brought up in. That's very important that we see that. Now, let me give you a few references where Paul speaks about this idea of Christianity being a fulfillment of Israel. You might want to see Acts 24, 14, Acts 26, 6. 2 Corinthians 11.22, and Philippians 3.5, where Paul speaks of his Jewishness and uh, his excitement about being part of the covenant people and the idea of the, the church being the fulfillment of the covenant community. Now, with, with a clear conscience, and this clear conscience is a characteristic of the pastoral epistles. Now, man has a conscience, which seems to mean an innate sense of right and wrong. And there is a sense in which all men have this inner conscience. Romans 1, 20, 24, and tw excuse me, Romans 2, uh, verses 24 and 25. Um, when the Holy Spirit indwells a person, this conscience uh, is freed up and able to function. But even believers sometimes have a problem with the cultural conditioning of this conscience. So it's, it needs to be Holy Spirit-led, biblically uh, articulate, not simply cultural, even for believers. Let me give you a few references of where it's used. Um, chapter 1, 
uh, this is 1 Timothy 1, 5, uh, 1, 19, 1 Timothy 4, 2, 2 Peter 3, 16, and Romans 2, 15 for the false, uh, the fallen people who had no sense. Their conscience were seared. Now, notice where it says, and I ceaselessly remember you in my prayers. There's a play on the word remember through here. It's used four times in a little different way. Once here in verse 3 and verse twice in verse 3, once in verse 4, and once again in verse 6. I remind you, bring to remembrance. Now he's thinking about Timothy. Oh, and how he loved this man. Every time he prayed, he thought of Timothy and prayed for him uh, in my prayers. Now Paul's prayer life for these churches was just amazing. He prayed for these churches over and over and over again. And a good example of that might be in Romans 1, 9, Philippians 1, 3, and Colossians 1, 3, where Paul prays over and over for these churches. Because I remember the tears you shed for me when they parted. It was emotional for Timothy. Um, and I always longing night and day to see you again, that I may feel the full, fullest joy on being remembered, reminded. And this is the aorist participle. Maybe a letter had come. Maybe someone brought word about Timothy and how he was doing. And Paul said, oh, that, that just jars my memory on how much I love you and think about you. Of your genuine faith. This is the word sincere, usually. It comes from uh, the... The word hypocrite, which means to judge under a mask, with the alpha privative, which means he was an open, sincere, honest, genuine person. And his faith was that. A faith that first found a home in the heart of your grandmother Lois, and then in your heart of your mother Eunice, and now in yours too, I am sure. Now the I am sure is a perfect passive participle. It sounds a little tentative in English, but in Greek it's a great affirmation. Now some have said, does this mean his grandmother and mother were simply good Jews? Well, that's possible, but I really think that maybe his grandmother was the first to receive Christ on the first missionary journey, and she led her daughter to Christ, and her daughter led her son to Christ, and the whole family uh, was Christian. That probably is what it's speaking of. Now, notice the idea here of a family, a Christian family tradition. My brothers and sisters, you can't give your children anything better than a Christian heritage. Money can't buy the value and peace and security that comes from parents who know Jesus imparting that to their kids. Hang in there. You're giving them the best in the world when you pass on your faith in the Lord Jesus to them. Now, notice where it mentions here. Um, For this reason, I now remind you to rekindle and keep burning the fire of the divine gift which came upon you when I laid my hands upon you. Now, the idea here, you might want to see 1 Timothy 4.14 where the elders lay hands on him. Some have wondered if this was at Lystra, or if it was some time later, maybe back at Antioch, beginning of the next missionary journey. We don't know where it happened. We don't know all that's involved, but Paul was there. He laid his hands on Timothy. There were other elders there. They laid their hands on Timothy. And at this moment, a spiritual gift seemed to be imparted or confirmed. Now, usually spiritual gifts come at the time of regeneration. Uh, But here, some special manifestation or maybe a prophetic utterance about Timothy's gift came apparently at his time of we might call it ordination. Now, this idea of laying hands on somebody seems to begin in the Old Testament. It begins in the patriarchal blessing. You might want to see Genesis 48, 14 and following, where the patriarch prayed a special gift on the children at that special time of, of a patriarchal blessing. We may want to see Leviticus 16, where the idea of laying hands on somebody was a sense of the transfer of guilt. Jesus laid hands on many people to heal them. That has nothing to what we're talking about. The idea of laying hands in the sense of leadership seems to begin with the Levites. Uh, the whole congregation, all the congregation laid hands on them in Numbers 8.10. And this may be a form of congregational polity in an incipient form. And then we had where Moses uh, commissioned Joshua. A leader commissions his successor, uh, Numbers 27.32 and Deuteronomy 34.9. This is, in a real sense, the apostolic kind of church polity where Paul does to Timothy. You say, well, do you believe in apostolic succession? I believe in a a succession of true teaching passed down, uh, not in the sense of uh, special ordained or equipped leaders. And then finally, uh, the leaders, the presbytery, the elders seem to pass on in Acts 13.3. And that may be the ideal of Presbyterian polity, where a clergy and laity together somehow form a group. I think all three polity forms in the New Testament. We've got to be careful about building a whole lot of theology on ordination because we just don't have a whole lot of details here. And I really think our modern thing of ordination has very little, very little biblical basis. Now, 
the divine gift, the root word here is grace. It's the word charismata. It's a given. Um, notice this can't be a proof text for apostolic succession in the traditional sense, but there is a true apostolic succession of divine teaching. Paul wanted Timothy to be a secure and faithful link in the chain as he was. That's what we ought to want to be, not innovators or, or great somebodies, but a, a true and faithful link in the chain of apostolic truth, apostolic witness about the person and work of Christ uh, and, and all it contains. Now, notice where it says, uh, For the spirit that God has given us does not impart timidity, but power and love and self-control. Now, my Williams has the word spirit capitalized. You know, in the original text, there is no capitalization or punctuation. Uh, the NASV, the RSV, the King James, and the ASV all have little s, which means man's spirit. And I think that's what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit energizes man's spirit uh, in, this, in what sense? Well, to give us power, to give us love, and to give us self-control. And I think that's good. That's what, uh, what uh, God's people ought to have is those three characteristics. So you must never be ashamed uh, of me as his prisoner. Some see this chapter based on a play on the word ashamed. It's used here uh, in verse 8. It's used again in verse 12. It's used again in verse 16. And some see a play on this. I really don't think the structure is here, though obviously Paul is making a play on the word. Now, the word ashamed here, you might will see Romans 1, 16, where he's not ashamed of the gospel. This is aorist subjunctive. This is not a present imperative of the May article, which means stop an act in process. It's the aorist subjunctive. It means don't ever start the act. So Timothy is not uh, ashamed. Paul's saying, don't be. He's not saying, you are, quit. He's saying, don't be. You might well see Mark 8:38, the ideal of, of not being ashamed of the Lord in public, and he won't be ashamed of us. But this is the idea of his prisoner. Paul was in prison. I believe it's his uh, final imprisonment. I believe this is the end of his fourth missionary journey, and he is going to be beheaded by Nero. Now, notice the, the, the idea of suffering where it says, uh, but suffer for the good news in fellowship with me. Now, the word soon is a preposition used all the way through these first few chapters. It means joint participation in or together with, that idea. Uh, now, this idea of suffering for the good news, what does that mean? Well, I want to give you a few references to this aspect of the gospel we've really missed. You might want to see 2 Timothy 2.3. You might want to see Romans 8.17. You might want to see 1 Peter 4.12 through 19. This is an aorist imperative. Now, suffering is the norm for those who want to really serve Christ. It's not health, wealth, prosperity, and good cheer. If we love Christ with all our hearts and stand up for him in a godless world, we're going to reap persecution and suffering. Now, not because of evil that we do, but simply because we're Christians. I hope you read those three passages. It's so important that we see that suffering is the norm. Jesus was perfected by the things that he suffered. God's irreducible plan for every one of his children is not health, wealth, prosperity, good cheer, but Christ's likeness. And quite often, Christ's likeness comes through a struggle with circumstances, a struggle with our faith. But it's good for us. It, it's, it's beneficial. It's for our good. Now, notice where it says, by the power of God. I want you to know, when we suffer, we suffer not in our resources, but in God's power and God's will. Now, suffering sometimes is punitive. Uh, so, sometimes it's, uh, it has a teaching thing. Uh, so it's not, you can't say there's a guy who's suffering, he must have sinned. That's what the book of Job and Psalm 73 all react against. And so suffering is sometimes in the will of God. Um, For he saved us, eris tense, and called us with a holy call, eris tense. Now this emphasis on called is a beginning emphasis on predestination. You might want to see uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 and 11. Another plan. There's three emphasis here on that we were called before the foundation of the earth. He called us. And look a little further down. His own purpose and grace. And a little further down. Uh, in union with Christ Jesus, eternal ages ago. Wow. You mean God knew us and put his stamp on us before the worlds were created? Yes. That's what Ephesians 1, that's what Revelation 13, 8 is saying. Hallelujah. What a tremendous passage. I believe predestination is for the saved, for encouragement, not against the lost, but for the saved. Boy, it'll help you in those dark days to know God chose you and put his name on you and called you out. Now, not in accordance with anything we have done. It's not according to works. Now, we're saved unto good works. But we're not saved according to works. Now, you might want to see... Uh, 
Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we're saved by grace through faith, but unto good works. Now, here's some other passages that talk about we're not saved by works. Romans 9, 11, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and Titus 3, 5, okay? Now, not that we have done, but in accordance with his own grace. Foreknowledge is not the basis for predestination. We're not saved because God knew we'd do the right thing. We're saved for God's grace. He is the initiating one. He calls us. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not our goodness. And you might want to see that. Now, uh, has shown us through union with Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only way that we can come to God's riches and bounty and grace. You might want to see John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. John 10, I'm the way of the sheepfold. I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. Anyone who does not come by me is a thief and a robber. Jesus is the only way. Not denominational arrogance. Jesus is the only way to God. Now, notice where it mentions verse 10. But has only recently been made known through the appearance. This is the word epiphany. Now, there are two terms in here for second coming. The word epiphany here in verse 10 and the word that day in verse 12 and verse 18. The Bible uses several terms for the second coming. It uses the word parousia, mostly in First and Second Thessalonians. The word epiphany, mostly in the pastorals. The word apocalypsis, which is used twice in the New Testament. And that day is used many times. It goes by the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Jesus Christ, the day of Christ, that day, the day. All reference to the second coming. Now, notice where it says, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That title has earlier been used for God the Father. Now it's here used for Jesus the Son. Woo, hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? Uh, full deity of Jesus Christ, who through the good news has put a stop to the power of death. And this word put a stop is a terribly uh, difficult Greek word to get an English translation on. It means made inoperative. It's like pulling the plug from electrical appliance. It's what Jesus has done to death and to our sin nature. You might want to see Romans chapter 6, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and 26, to make inoperative, all right? We're still going to die, but the principle of death and destruction is, is not going to live in us or, or have sway over us. Though we are die physically, we'll never die, really, because we know Jesus, and he is the one who has life and immortality. Now, who has brought us life and immortality to light, okay? Of uh, this good news, I have been appointed. Now, this is an aorist passive. He didn't volunteer. He was drafted. Three things, a preacher, a proclaimer, an apostle, a, a, a founder, a director, uh, uh, a sent representative, an ambassador, and a teacher. This seems to me a systematic teacher of the truth. And Paul had three different gifts. This is why I am suffering so, but I am not ashamed of it, for I know whom. Now, aren't you glad it's not what? It, theology is good, but theology is only good when we know him who gave the theology. Whom? Now, boy, I have trusted. Perfect tense. Trusted in the past. I still trust. And I am absolutely sure, perfect tense, no doubt, that he is able to guard, preserve, keep. You might want to see 1 Timothy 1, 4 and 5. What I have entrusted, now this word entrusted is, is the idea, uh, uh, let me go down, if you'll look at verse 14 where it says, guard the fine deposit of truth, and go down to chapter 2, verse 2, where it says, I commit to you, that's the root, same root, deposit. Now because it's this banking term of putting something on deposit, it's used in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 20, it's used in 2 Timothy 1, 14, 12 and 14. Now, because it's the word deposit, I really think Paul's saying, I, I know you're going to guard in me what you put in me. I think it's what God has put in us, the gospel. God's, God's going to protect the gospel until Paul dies. God's going to keep it pure. I don't think it's Paul's soul or trust in God that's mentioned here, but God's keeping that, that faith, keeping that trust, keeping that gospel, keeping it true in Paul, uh, to him until that day, and there's that second coming. Continue, present tense, to be an example. This is a preliminary sketch or a pattern, an architect's original plan in wholesome instruction, which you learn from me, in faith and love that come through union with Jesus Christ. We need orthodoxy, yes, but we also need it in love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about. You can be absolutely conservative, but if it's not motivated by love, it's not from God. And both must be there. That's why he says the faith and love here. I think it's so important we see that orthodoxy without love is not from God, just like love without, without proper doctrine 
is not from God. They're two sides of one coin. Now, uh, guard the fine deposit of truth by the aid of the Holy Spirit, which is, has his home in your hearts. Now, look, here's the human and divine element. Timothy must guard it, aorist imperative. But really, it's through the Holy Spirit. It's God's action. You might well see Philippians 1, 6. It is, it is uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trinity. It is God that worketh in you to will and do his good pleasure. There's a human and divine element in everything that God does with man. God always takes initiative in grace. It's always God's power. It's always God's resource. It's always God's initiation. But man must respond by faith. Man always must participate in the free gifts of God's riches and grace. So it's always a human and divine action in everything having to do with faith. Remember that. Now, this Holy Spirit indwells in our hearts. Present tense, he continues to. Usually we think of the Holy Spirit as indwelling us, but many times in the Bible it's the Lord Jesus that indwells us. In Romans 8, 9, and 10, it mentions both. You might want to see uh, Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Or Galatians 2, 20, uh, I am crucified, and yet Christ liveth in me. So the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus are so close, they're almost synonymous as far as the titles used for them. I hope you'll send for my tape on that uh, called The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit where I've talked about the close connection between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 15, that you know that everyone here who belongs to the Roman province of Asia has deserted me. Now, this seems to refer not to deserting the faith, but deserting Paul. I think it's his last trial before Nero. They knew he was probably going to get killed, and they wouldn't come and testify. Seems to be what it's referring to. Now, two are mentioned, uh, Phygeus and Homogenes. We don't know any more about them except probably they deserted Paul in his time of need. Verse 16, May the Lord show mercy to the family of Onesimus. Uh, Onesiphorus, and this you might want to see him mentioned in chapter 4, verse 19 again. Now, because of verse 18, where it mentions, uh, may the Lord grant mercy at, uh, at his hands on that day to Onesiphorus, some have said he's dead. That's why it mentions his family. But if this is true, it's the only place in the whole New Testament where Paul prays for the dead. And because you can't let one verse determine the whole New Testament, I think he's probably alive. Maybe he hadn't got back to his family yet, and Paul knew that. And so he's praying for his family till he gets there. I don't think this is biblical evidence for us praying for the dead. I really don't. Now, because he has often cheered me, was not ashamed of me. There's that word ashamed, that play on the words here. Yes, when I got to Rome, he took pains to look me up and finally found me. Now, it was dangerous to look for a, a, a prisoner about to be executed. Uh, and he had to go through a lot of red tape. It wasn't like Paul's uh, imprisonment when he wrote, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. He, he could have friends, and they could come in and out. This was a much more severe imprisonment, and it took this man a long time to find him. It was dangerous to want to talk to someone who was charged with treason, yet this man looked for Paul, found it, helped him maybe monetarily, but for sure encouragement in his presence and friendship. May the Lord grant that he may find mercy at his hands on that day. And there's that empty. Now we'll see 2 Thessalonians 1.10 for that day, the second coming. Uh, and you well know yourself how great were the services he rendered me at Ephesus. Now here Paul again is remembering this, this great uh, fellow worker and soldier and trying to say, Timothy, emulate him. Now on Onesiphorus was not ashamed of Paul, and Paul encourages Timothy earlier on not to be ashamed of him either. Now why exactly they would be ashamed of Paul is not known, except that he was in prison, he was a, 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 seemed like a criminal, and yet... It was, for the, it was for God's purpose that he was there. You mean prison can sometimes be in the will of God? Well, Paul's star in the flesh was in the will of God. Here he says his imprisonment was in the will of God. He says he's suffering uh, and, 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 and hanging on by the power of God. This is a difficult thing for us, but I do think that God many times sends things that seem hurtful to us, difficult for us to understand. But if we'll trust him, They'll work out best for us and him in the long run. And that seemed to be Paul's imprisonment. Uh, it's so difficult. I've done a tape on, called Suffer, Why Me? based on 1 Peter 4, 12 and following. I hope you'll read that. Uh, and we'll be happy to make that available to you if you'll send for our free catalog. This is a great opening to a book. It's so personal. It's much more personal, 2 Timothy is, than 1 Timothy. Paul's last word to his friend. Oh, hang in there, Timothy. Be true. Hang in there, Timothy. Confront these false teachers in love. Stand up, Timothy. Don't give them a chance to, uh, to, to snatch away these new believers. But, Timothy, 
do it appropriately. Give him an example to follow by your love and by your orthodoxy. And we need to remember that God's uh, people walk and talk together. Um, and, and it's so important that Paul informs him here. Now, I think this letter was probably again read publicly. That's why it seems so formal in parts. Uh, and yet, this is the type of letter, the pastorals, and especially this last one, is where new preachers, th this, this is the kind of thing that ought to encourage new preachers, uh, church leaders. Th this, is, this is the aged apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit giving us some guidelines for attitudes and methods and procedures of the ministry. And, and it's so important that we see that. Well, I hope you'll send for those tapes I mentioned. And we'll be in chapter 2 next week. I've enjoyed being with you. I hope you'll pray for us as we study this. And I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless.